What goes through the narcissist's mind when he idealizes you? What goes through the psychopath's mind when he discards you? And what goes through the borderline's mind when she alternates and vacillates and oscillates and every other lates between her various dysregulated labile self-states? How does it feel to be inside the abuser's mind? Now, there are quite a few self-proclaimed narcissists who try to verbalize their inner experience. Some of them even do it honestly. <laughs> and there are quite a few victims, real ones, self-styled, professional ones, and covert narcissists posing to be victims, posing as victims. And all of them try somehow to get a handle, to grasp the inner landscape of the narcissist, the psychopath, and to a lesser extent, the borderline. I'm saying to a lesser extent, the borderline, because the borderline is much more human than the narcissist, let alone the psychopath. The thing is that in the absence of empathy and access to emotions, narcissists and psychopaths are not fully human in any true sense of the word. No amount of empathy can help here. What is needed is scholarship. And so this video is based on studies, published papers, academic journals, articles, and the decades-long work of luminaries from, let's say, Kernberg, Kohut, Theodor Millen, all the way down to Twenge, or all the way up, if you wish, to Twenge and Campbell. To this, I can add my own personal experience and the fact that I have a da database of 1,783, true to this morning, uh, diagnosed narcissists and psychopaths, people diagnosed officially with narcissistic personality disorder, an antisocial personality disorder by professionals and diagnosticians, not by their own spouses or angry neighbors or colleagues. And in this database of 1,783 individuals, they responded to a structured questionnaire with 683 questions. If you multiply the two, you get a, an overwhelming database regarding the, what it means, how does it feel to be a narcissist. So today I'm going to discuss the narcissist, how does he experience you, not the other way. And so first of all, it's, it's critical to make a distinction between narcissists and psychopaths. This distinction is often lost online by self-styled experts and others. And they often confuse, uh, irredeemably confuse, Narcissists and psychopaths. They attribute to narcissists many things which are actually the domain of psychopathy. And they very often attribute to psychopaths many behaviors which are exclusive to narcissists. It is true that every psychopath has a pronounced streak of grandiosity. And it is true that some narcissists, the small minority, are psychopathic narcissists. They are antisocial, defiant, lack impulse control and so on. But that's a tiny, tiny group. They used to be known as malignant narcissists. In today's video, I'm going to discuss the classic narcissists, the overt classic narcissists, not the covert, not the malignant, which are tiny minorities, but the run-of-the-mill pedestrian narcissists that you're very likely to come across, because anywhere between 1%, um, 1.5% 1 .1 and 6% of the population, depending on which study you, you believe, which study you trust, are narcissists, people with pronounced narcissistic traits, behaviors, style, and personality. So these are the narcissists you're going to come across. Similarly, when, I'm, when I will discuss psychopaths a bit later, I'm going to discuss the typical psychopath, not the serial killer. <laughs> Most serial killers are sexual sadists and, and also psychopaths, but they are rare. Luckily, there are a few of them, you know, so it's a bit pointless to mix 
to, to create this melange or cocktail of, of all these types because it's very misleading and very confusing. So let's start with the narcissist. For you as a, as a victim or a potential victim or a survivor or someone who might come across a narcissist in your daily life, in the workplace, in a romantic setting, on a dating app, for you it's critical to understand that as far as a narcissist is concerned, there is no distinction between his fantasy life and real life. He has impaired reality testing. He has cognitive deficits. And the very essence and definition of pathological narcissism is a grandiose fantasy. Narcissism is a fantasy defense. Fantasy is a psychological defense mechanism. And narcissism is the fantasy defense mechanism writ large. And narcissists cannot make the distinction between fantasy and reality. Also, because they interact with inner objects. They confuse, exactly like psychotics, they confuse inner objects with outer, external objects. I, you're all acquainted by now, I hope, with the famous mechanism of snapshotting, where they interact with a snapshot of you. They take a snapshot of you and then they interact with it, with your representation, with your avatar, with your introject, not with you. And so what they do, they internalize external objects, especially significant objects, and especially objects that can cause them pain, and so they, by abandoning them. So they internalize these objects and then they continue to interact with the internal representations within a shared fantastic space. And they can't tell the difference. This is why they mislabel emotions. Narcissists feel intense emotions. Many, many scholars uh, speculated that perhaps narcissism and psychopathy are, are reactions, defensive reactions, defensive attempts to avoid very, very deep emotionality. Perhaps narcissists and psychopaths, or at least narcissists, emote too much, too strongly, too intensely. They are about to be, to be overwhelmed by their emotions. So they isolate themselves from their emotions. They put a firewall. They put a moat and a fence and a fortress and a fortification to avoid their emotions. And this is why Rothstein and other scholars suggest that borderlines, people with borderline personality disorders, are people who had tried to become narcissists and failed. These people are overwhelmed by dysregulated emotions. These people drown in their emotions, like COVID-19, emotional COVID-19. They drown in their own emotions because they can't control these emotions. And these emotions are much stronger than they are. And they don't have a narcissistic defense. So narcissists are capable of intense emotions. The thing is that they feel, the, they experience the emotion, but they don't know what it is. Because they are divorced from reality and they have this cognitive deficit and impaired reality testing, they ask themselves, what am I feeling now? What is it that I'm feeling now? Oh, it must be love. So they say, well, I love you. <laughs> they mislabel or they say, I must be angry. Narcissists experience their emotions through a cognitive analytical filter. They have to ask themselves, what they're feeling. And then they compare their experiences, their reactions, their moods, their affect, their behaviors. They compare all this to an internal database, a database where they have entries and listings for how people behave when. How people behave when they are sad. They cry, I cry, therefore I'm sad. How people behave when they're happy, they smile. I'm smiling now, therefore I must be happy. How people behave when they're in love, they crave the presence of the loved one. I crave the presence of my intimate partner, so probably I love her. Of course, the narcissist craves the presence of his intimate partner because she gives him supply. But he, he even if he's aware of what supply is, and most narcissists, by the way, are self-aware. It's another idiotic myth online that they are not. Most of them are. They're just proud of their disorder. 
but they are self-aware. Self-aware, but mislabel. Self-aware, but get it wrong. Self-aware, but don't understand what they are aware of. So, very often they think they are in love. And they embed this love in the shared fant this perception of love, misperception of love, in, in a shared fantasy. It's fantastic love, because everything in the narcissist's life has to be bigger than life. Has to be fantastic, has to be amazing, has to be perfect, has to be brilliant, has to be everything is grandiose. So the love must be grandiose. And there is a difference between the shared fantasy of a narcissist and the shared fantasy of a psychopath. I'm reading books where there is God Almighty confusion between the two. The shared fantasy of a narcissist involves imperfect mirroring. In other words, the shared fantasy of a narcissist uh, survives differences between the parties, survives friction, survives disagreement and criticism and so on. It's punishment, but it survives these things. The shared fantasy of a psychopath is perfect mirroring. The psychopath doesn't live, doesn't live um, daylight between himself and his target. The psychopath emulates and imitates the target to perfection so that the target feels that she had found her soulmate, her twin, her doppelganger, her, her other the one she's been searching for all her life, in other words, herself. So while narcissistic mirroring idealizes the partner, allowing her to fall in love with her idealized image, psychopathic mirroring includes idealization, of course, plus the added element of identity between the psychopath and his newfound so-called love or intimate partner and the victims of psychopaths fall for it they feel that they had found the perfect resonance that they had been looking for all their lives this is rare with a narcissist what the victims of narcissists feel is that they had found someone who makes them feel good about themselves at the beginning at least when the shared fantasy is established both types love bomb, but usually only the psychopath grooms. And when the shared fantasy is a psychopathic shared fantasy, and it, is, it reaches its natural end, its expiry, many psychopaths become long-term stalkers before they finally let go if they do, contra to information online. It is the narcissist who would let go of a shared fantasy and move on to another target. The famous idealize, devalue, discard, replace is a narcissistic strategy because the narcissist is in need of a shared fantasy all the time. He cannot survive a minute without a shared fantasy. So he immediately replaces a defunct, a dead, an expired shared fantasy with a new one. The psychopath is different. The psychopath is goal-oriented. We'll come to it in a minute. And when his shared fantasy goes down the drain, he won't accept it. He won't accept it, and many of them become long-term stalkers. And this is regardless of whether the fantasy was active or not. In other words, regardless if there was a relationship at all, um, or whether it was all in the psychopath's head. In the case of the narcissist, some narcissists become stalkers, but they become stalkers within an active shared, psychos uh, shared fantasy. In other words, narcissists stalk only as long as the partner gives them hope. For example, as long as the partner remains physically, cohabits with them, doesn't leave home. As long as the partner keeps calling them, may communicating with them as long as the partner keeps dropping hints that, you know. So, as long as the shared fantasy is active, the narcissist will stalk, will stalk the target. That is the process of hoovering, in effect. 
the psychopath will stalk even after the, the, the shirt fantasy is dead, as far as the other, as far as the partner is concerned. Because the psychopaths, the psychopaths are defiant. It's my way or the highway. I will decide when the shirt fantasy is over, not you. Narcissus is different. Narcissus says, as long as you give me hope, I will be after you. I will keep coming, keep coming back for more. Keep trying to coerce you, to convince you to return to the shared fantasy. But the minute the narcissist is truly mortified, gets through his, th his thick skull that it's over, he has to move on with alacrity, with speed, because he cannot survive a second without a shared, uh, shared fantasy. Within the shared fantasy, there's another difference. The narcissist in the shared fantasy, because the fantasy for him is a reality, he misjudges the nature of the relationship, exactly like the histrionic. He misjudges the intensity, the depth, the intimacy, the commitment of the other party, the motives of the other party, the lies that he is being told he believes, because he becomes pseudo-stupid, he becomes gullible within the shared fantasy. So, he misjudges the nature of the relationship, the nature of the shared fantasy, but he never misjudges the existence of the shared fantasy. In other words, after mortification, it becomes clear to him, the fantasy is dead. The psychopath is exactly the opposite. Psychopath never misjudges the nature of the shared fantasy because he creates it as a tool to manipulate. He's goal-oriented, or she's goal-oriented. He creates a shared fantasy because within the shared fantasy he can get what he wants. Sex, power, money, contacts, this, that, access. And psychopath does everything. Creates a simulation, creates a matrix within which his victims react exactly as they want them to react and further his aims and goals. So he never mistakes the nature of what's happening. But he sometimes mistakes the existence of the fantasy. Exactly opposite to the Nazis. He won't, he won't take no for an answer. And this is why psychopaths are very, very dangerous, much more dangerous as intimate partners than narcissists. The narcissist operates on kind of two tracks. He has a two-track mind. It's easier for the narcissist to operate with two tracks because the narcissist essentially is a broken personality. I even suggested many times. The narcissist has multiple personality. He has a true self and a false self, by definition. So it's a form of dissociative identity disorder. Narcissists dissociate a lot. They depersonalize, they realize. They have dissociative amnesia, exactly like borderlines. It's easier for narcissists to work on two tracks. And within the shared fantasy, the narcissist works on two tracks. There is this guy, if you wish, this entity, this locus, which is rarely wrong, clear-eyed, insightful, intuitive, analytical, prognos prognosticator. It's almost, I would say, supernatural, telepathic. The narcissist knows at every given moment when he's about to be betrayed, for example. And at the same time, at the very same time, concurrently, there is a child there, deluded, caught in the fantasy, erotomaniac, kind of, kind of uh, dependent, with an impaired reality test, with a confirmation bias, filters out information that is hurtful, countervailing. This second entity is always shocked when, when he is cheated on or betrayed in another way. The former entity communicates with his partners. The latter entity, the deluded child, communicates with him. The former entity is the one that interfaces with the, with the women, but the latter entity is the one that captivates the partner. So even in the partner, there's a similar duality, a similar break, which explains the unease when you are with the narcissist. You feel that it's sometimes you're communicating with a very hurt, very small child, and at other times with a pretty sharp cookie, with a tough, tough as nails 
um, lawyer type <laughs> who is you know won't take bullshit won't take no won't won't uh, buy your stories and lies and and everything see through you it's very penetrating in every way so this is the duality of the of the narcissist there's no such thing as a psychopath with a psychopath what you see is who you are there is no one there the psychopath is a perfect mirror the narcissist provides you with a whole of mirrors which reflect these mirrors reflect you wrongly by idealizing you. the narcissist provides you with a whole of mirrors which reflects you totally the emphasis is on totally not not so much on idealizing you but on being like you being identical to you so while the narcissist will tell you for example that you're good-hearted because it's part of the idealization the psychopath may tell you that you're actually pretty vicious exactly like him you're vicious i'm vicious we are one and the same we're the same person the psychopath's message is we are one organism we are one entity with two heads it's a merger and fusion message that's why it works wonderfully with codependence and with borderlines the psychopath messages your strong points your weak points your shortcomings your advantages your talents your skills your wishes your fears your needs your preferences your priorities your values your hopes your dreams everything it's exactly me the psychopath says how did you find me i'm you you positive and negative this is not the narcissist message the narcissist message is there's nothing negative in you you are perfection reified you are wow if you're beautiful you're drop dead gorgeous if you are intelligent you're a genius the narcissist flatters you counterfactually psychopath never does this psychopath just tells you i'm like you and so there's the issue of co-idealization which doesn't happen with the psychopath the narcissist's grandiosity crucially depends on co-idealization the only reason the narcissist idealizes his partner is so that he can feel idealized himself if the narcissist partner is the most drop-dead gorgeous super genius what does it say about the narcissist that she is his partner and no one else's imagine if your partner is bigger than life you are bigger than life if your partner is a genius you must be a genius otherwise why would she be with you if your partner is drop-dead gorgeous you must be irresistibly attractive idealizing your partner reflects on you it's a way to idealize yourself as a narcissist a way to buttress your grandiosity this process is called co-idealization it does not happen with psychopaths psychopaths are not interested at all in narcissistic supply their grandiosity the psychopath's grandiosity is inward looking it's it's self-sufficient it's self-contained the psychopath knows that he's superior end of story he doesn't need anyone to confirm it to him he just knows it it's a fact indisputable fact who can who can argue with that who can argue with it whoever argues with that is an idiot narcissist is not the same narcissist is compensatory he needs other people to tell him that he's superior and if people don't do that if they don't tell him that he's superior or they challenge his superiority it's very easy to destabilize is is very uncertain he is an external locus of control and so the, the psychopath does not co-idealize when and if the psychopath idealizes you it's part of a process of manipulating you subjugating you rendering rendering you addicted to his praise it's it's goal oriented it's a tool it's an instrument it has no reflection on him the psychopath is utterly unaffected by his idealization of you i mean who cares what you are really and who you are really what is it what does it all matter it's like you know me and Minnie.
co-idealization, the narcissist's co-idealization occurs simultaneously in two spaces. One space is real, one is imaginary. This is not the case with the psychopath. The narcissist, pathological narcissistic space is his stomping ground. It's a real space, it's a physical space. Could be his home, church, neighborhood pub, volunteer organization or workplace. It's a location. It's a location in which his sources of supply habitually congregate and interact to provide the narcissist with adulation and affirmation. Applause, you know, it's where he gets applause. So it could be a concert hall. And concurrent with this physical site, the narcissist maintains a shared fantasy space here in his mind. And within this shared fantasy space, he idealizes both himself and, and his intimate mate co-idealization. Psychopath doesn't have this. Psychopath has only a space, a single space, and it's a totally physical space. The psychopath does not have a shared fantasy with you. He creates a fantasy for you. Psychopath is a little like Disneyland. Disneyland, they don't think that Mickey Mouse is real or Minnie Mouse is real, but they give you Mickey Mouse and Minnie Mouse because you want it, makes you feel good. So it's the same with a psychopath. He creates a fantasy space for you, a Disneyland, a mental Disneyland. But he never, never makes the mistake of confusing this space that he had created, his work of art, with reality, like the narcissist does. So the psychopath has only physical locations or digital communication, which is also physical because you have to hold the smartphone. It's very, it not, the psychopath is very reality based. It doesn't have an impaired reality test. It doesn't give a shit about reality. It doesn't care. It doesn't mind. He's whimsical. He's prone to, to satisfy his impulses, never mind what, never mind who, never mind what's the cost. So he ignores reality because of his grandiosity. But he never mistakes it for a fantasy. Not so the narcissist. Narcissist is much more psychotic, much more psychotic than the psychopath. And I beg to differ with Kernberg and others, much more psychotic than the borderline. When the narcissist is forced to return to reality, when he's brutally awakened and decompensates, when his defenses crumble, fall apart, he usually does it Come, comes back to reality, wake, wakes up by, by having been narcissistically injured or even mortified. It's a precondition. The narcissist never abandons the fantasy because it's his reality. When he is expelled from the Garden of, Ed of Eden, when he's expelled from the Garden of Eden, there should be an angel there with a flaming sword or else he will try to re-enter the garden and eat another apple with the naked Eve. Mm, I love this imagery. Okay, so the narcissist is narcissistically injured, he's mortified, and then what he does, he devalues the fount of hurt and frustration. He devalues the source, he devalues the person who hurt him, who frustrated him. Usually it's the intimate partner, but it doesn't have to be. What He uses the infantile splitting defense mechanism. You remember what is splitting? Black and white, good and bad, good and evil, right and wrong. Everything is 100% good, 100% bad, 100% evil, 100% uh, good, 100% uh, gratifying, 100% frustrating. But it's always 100%. We call it dichotomous thinking. Black or white thinking. All or nothing. All or nothing thinking. So he uses this infantile splitting defense to render his partner the polar opposite of her erstwhile idealized version. So if she were if she were in the idealized version, drop dead gorgeous, now she's getting old. If she were a genius, now she's either a genius only in certain things or really very stupid. But exactly as idealizing the partner resulted in self-idealization. You know, remember co-idealization? Like he idealizes the partner, he idealizes himself. So it stands to reason that devaluing the partner should result in self-devaluation. And narcissists go through this phase. 
They asked themselves, how could I have been so stupid and blind and gullible and wrong and fallible to not see how inferior she is? And this is a phase that is common to narcissists and to victims of narcissists, ironically. Don't forget, narcissists are the outcome of narcissistic abuse in early childhood. They are post-traumatized. They're in a post-traumatic condition. I even suggest that narcissism is not a personality disorder, but a post-traumatic state. So ex they have exactly the same reactions like the victim of narcissistic abuse, but infused, tinged, imbued, painted over with grandiosity. And to avoid this excruciating outcome of saying to himself, I've been stupid, I've been wrong, I've been... To avoid this excruciating outcome, to avoid this inner, internally generated challenge to his grandiosity, the narcissist engenders an external modification. You remember when in the four videos where we analyze, where I analyze modification, I told you that modification, the, the, one of the ways to cope with modification is to replace it with another modification, which is much more acceptable. So the narcissist creates another modification, which is more acceptable to him. And this modification says, she is evil, she's dumb, she's a psychopathic bitch, and I must punish her. And immediately, he embarks on a new round of co-idealization with the next available and willing target or victim or prey. Because he can't live a second without a shared fantasy. Remember, fantasy is his reality. When he is taken out of the fantasy, he feels the same way you feel when you are caught in a nightmare. It's exactly. Nasi's world is a mirror image of your world. What to you is reality to him is fantasy, and what to you is fantasy to him is reality. So when he's, when he's forced to confront reality as it is, he feels he's caught in a nightmare from which he cannot wake up except through the good services of a new intimate partner. And now let's transition to the psychopath. Contrary to the narcissist, the psychopath has no emotions. None. End of story. Narcissists have emotions. They're terrified of their own emotions, so they isolate themselves from their emotions. There are a few videos on my channel which deal with this. Psychopaths have no emotions. They were born, we now know, with abnormalities in the brain. Extremely simple. Psychopathy, very similar to schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, autism, is a brain disorder. It's lumped together for some utterly oblivious and incomprehensible reason. It's lumped together with, for example, narcissism, just because both of them are grandiose. It's wrong. Psychopaths, as Cleckley observed in 1942, psychopaths are actually a form they are very difficult to distinguish between them and, let's say, crazy people. Because they have a brain problem. So they have no emotions. What they have instead of emotions is steerings, whims. They're like zombies who receive electrical, tiny electrical shocks. And they, they, it's like a frog in the, in the biology lab, you know, the dead frog that you inject electricity and it jumps or it flexes its its legs, its dead legs. Psychopath is dead. Dead inside, dead outside. It's a walking, talking simulation of a human being. It's a brilliant, wonderful, amazing simulation. So it can convince you that it has empathy, has emotions, uh, is healing, is changing. Is a, it's, it's a wonderful rendition of a perfect human being. And it is this perfection that it is that is the first sign of trouble. If he's too good to be true, he's a psychopath. And there are two types of psychopaths essentially. There's the mischievous psychopath. I call it the Cleckley psychopath, after Harvey Cleckley, the father of the study of psychopathy, together with Kaufman. So the mischievous psychopath, I think, has affinity with the secondary psychopath. The secondary psychopath is capable of some rudimentary conscience, empathy, and emotions. Some. A little. And the secondary psychopath is about entertainment. 
He is focused on having fun, entertaining himself. He's bored. All the time he's bored. And he's converting his, his own life into a big theme park, into a show, an interminable show, stand-up comedy show. And other people are props. So he uses you, he's likely to use you, he's likely to compromise you, to co-opt you, brainwash you, condition you, idealize you, addict you, uh, groom you, you name it. But he's doing all this in order to toy with you. He likes to play with you. And once he's done, he's like a child in this sense, he's not childish. Psychopaths are never childish, unlike the narcissist. But he behaves like a child. So once he's done with you, done, I don't know, dismantling you, disassembling you, breaking you apart, putting you back together, <laughs> nobody's, you know, toy with you, essentially. Could be sex, could be just sex. But once he's done with you, he discards you. Exactly like a child discards an old toy in favor of, of a new one. And it's all been about entertainment. Then this kind of mischievous psychopath realizes that he cannot, I mean, you won't agree. He rarely agree to participate in such a thing. So he tells you stories exactly like the narcissist. Exactly like the narcissist who wants to engender a shared fantasy. Psychopath also would lie to you. I don't know, promise you love, um, a romantic affair, marriage, a business partnership. The second type of psychopath is goal-oriented. I call it the hair psychopath or the babyak psychopath after the two scholars who dedicated their lives to studying this kind of psychopath. And the goal-oriented psychopath, also known as the primary psychopath, his role, his, uh, his goal-oriented, as <laughs> the name implies, so he wants something. Uh, I don't know, sex, he wants money, he wants access, he wants your contacts, he wants your address book, he wants, uh, he want, he, he wants to have, to, he wants to team up with your friend, not with you, but he needs to go through you. He wants to get something from your father, but he needs to pretend that he's your lover so that your father gives him money. And he has something in mind. He always has something in mind. He's manipulative. And he's going through all this exercise with you to captivate you so that he's able to manipulate you. So the first type, the mischievous type, wants to play with you. He's a playmate psychopath. And the second type is a goal-oriented psychopath. He wants to use you. He wants to exploit you. And now we come to the borderline. Borderline is a very complex disorder. It's a complex disorder because it has elements borrowed from other cluster B personality disorders. It has the narcissist's grandiosity. It has the psychopath's defiance and lack of impulse control. It has object inconstancy. It has defense mechanisms, which are typical of narcissists. It has histrionic behavior, for example, hyper-emotionality, misjudging the nature and depth of intimacy and relationships. So, borderline is a kind of amalgam, cocktail, presi, uh, dictionary, <laughs> encyclopedia, of all other cluster B personality disorders, but coupled with, coupled with elements which are typical of other clusters, for example, seriously dysregulated emotions, modal ability, which very often imitates bipolar disorder, it's not, but imitates bipolar disorder, um, irascibility and rage, which are typical of some schizophrenics and paranoids. The borderline, in this sense, is not a real clinical entity. That's why when we look at borderlines, we can divide them into types and, and subtypes and sub-subtypes and species and sub-subspecies endlessly to the end, to doomsday, because each borderline has their own disorder. It's a little like um, you take a, a, a woman, most borderlines are women, you take a woman and tell her, okay, go through the DSM and pick up, you know, as many traits, characters, characteristics and behaviors as you wish from any disorder that you want. So no, no borderline is identical to the other. Not one is identical to the other. It's, it's like 
if there's, for example, 100 million borderlines, then there's 100 million types of borderline personality disorder. Makes it extremely difficult for their intimate partners to cope with them, to live with them, to anticipate them, to manage them, to manage the relationship, to communicate with them. Very difficult. Still, of course, all borderlines have a few things they share in common. And, and within today's presentation, what is important to understand that is that the borderline transitions, cycles. There's a borderline cycle. She encounters some problem, a frustration, a real rejection, an imagined rejection, a humiliation. Uh, an abuse, she's been abused, or she thinks she has been abused. A lot of borderline, the borderline exactly like the narcissist, is an impaired reality test and magical thinking. So everything that happens in her head is actually reality. I mean, if, if you think, it must be so. And so whenever I say rejection or humiliation or abuse or withholding, or it could be real, it could be imaginary or anticipated even. She predicts it's going to happen. And so she reacts to frustration, not with aggression. There is a classic hypothesis in 1939 by Dollard that frustration breeds aggression. It's true generally. The borderline is a bit different. Initially, she reacts to aggression by becoming a narcissist. She has grandiose, by becoming simultaneously, I'm sorry, a narcissist and a secondary psychopath. Simultaneously. It's extremely unsettling to watch. I've had the privilege <laughs> or the misfortune of watching quite a few borderlines go through this. It, it's, it resembles to a very high degree the switching between personalities in someone with multiple personality disorder. And that's why many, many scholars suggest that borderline personality disorder is a dissociative identity disorder, is a dissociative state. So that the borderline has many self states. They are not personalities. They are not that well developed, but they are distinguishable. And if you ever saw a borderline faced with frustration, for example, rejection or withholding or being ignored, or being abused, you can see when you watch her, you can see her changing, metamorphosizing, shape shifting. And then she kind of splits. There's a part of her that becomes a narcissist. And the second part becomes a secondary psychopath. So as a narcissist, she would suddenly become very grandiose with impaired reality testing. Disempathic. Borderlines are usually empathic, but she would become then disempathic. Vicious even. And then as a secondary psychopath, she would be cold and calculated. She would think how to hurt, how to harm how to cause pain. She would become even a bit sadistic. She would be defiant. She would have no impulse control. She would not consider the consequences of her actions. She would have zero object constancy, out of sight, out of mind. And she would split. You would become, when she's a secondary psychopath and a narcissist simultaneously, you become all bad, a persecutory object, to be eliminated, to be destroyed, to be devastated, to be ruined. To be smashed, to be, and and she she kind of runs herself into a frenzy, and this frenzy is psychopathic frenzy. Anyone who has witnessed a psychopathic rage attack knows what I'm talking about. At the same time, she insists on her grandiosity as a defense against the frustration. It's her way of defending, exactly like the narcissist. And so she is irresistible to both the narcissist and the psychopath. The psychopath sees in her a perfect vessel for manipulation, a container of his tactics. But she is so easy, so easy to manipulate. All you need to do is press a few buttons. Kernberg and others suggested that it's a very disorganized personality, very low level of organization, very chaotic. It's very easy to manipulate her. And what the narcissist sees in her is a soulmate. She's equally grandiose. And she knows how to gratify him because she is also a narcissist in some ways. And so 
Borderline is very likely, exactly like the codependent, by the way, these two types are very likely to agree willingly and lovingly and eagerly to participate in the narcissist's shared fantasy and to submit themselves to a psychopath, a primary psychopath. The borderline feels safe with a primary psychopath because she has the personal experience of what it means to be a psychopath. As a secondary psychopath, she feels strong, she feels empowered, she feels in control, she feels that she has the power to inflict pain rather than experience pain. She feels she can dysregulate other people, situations. So the primary psychopath is like her, is what, what she wants to be when she grows up. Is like an idol, a rock star, a, the ideal that she aspires to in many ways, makes her feel safe and protected and understood and taken to a new extreme or a new level, elevated. Very often we find among, for example, couples who are serial killers, we find one borderline and one, one's primary psychopath. And on the other hand, she's also open to participate in the shared fantasy of the narcissist. Because the narcissist idealizes, idealizes his intimate partner and caters to the borderline's grandiosity, which is her main and only defense against dysregulation, liability, and utterly intolerable, tolerable, unbearable pain, which drives close to 11% of borderlines to commit suicide. So borderline finds both of them irresistible, because both of them truly are her soulmates. My name is Sam Vaknin, and I'm the author of Malignant Self-Love, Narcissism Revisited. One last comment. Many of you, women of course, wrote to me, I never cheated on my husband, I never dreamt of cheating on my, hus on my husband, the thought never crossed my mind. Allow me to disbelieve a lot of this, but let's assume I believe you. You should really, really watch videos much more carefully. I made very clear in my previous video that I'm giving cheating as an example of a cause for mortification. I even mentioned explicitly that it doesn't have to be cheating. It can be absconding with the family's money. It can be other reckless behaviors. I don't know, unbridled shopping, gambling, pathological gambling, or just packing up your things and disappearing, which is an aggressive, aggressive, dysregulated act. I mean, there are many ways to mortify a narcissist. One of the most common ways is cheating. And because narcissists profess, profess to be maximally mortified by cheating, I took that as an example, an idealized example. But ladies, please listen well before you make comments. Thank you.